On the 30th of August 1920, Dagmar Overby received a knock on the front door from a young factory worker named Caroline Olsen. Please forgive me if my pronunciation of names and places in this video are not quite right, but I'll do my best. Caroline arrived at the doorstep with a three-week-old daughter Sarah who was born out of wedlock and the idea was to leave the baby with Dagmar who was operating an adoption agency. Unbeknown to Caroline, she left her newborn with Denmark's most disturbing female serial killer who either strangled, drowned or burnt babies under her care. But without realising, Caroline's actions would bring an end to the monstrous activities of the woman she'd just met. We'll be talking about that in detail, as well as looking at the life of Dagmar. Hi there my friend, I'm Royston. Welcome back to the channel. Now this case takes us to Denmark during the early part of the 20th century, where we come face to face with one of its infamous female serial killers. Interestingly, the horrific crime she committed made a significant impact on Denmark's law, creating debate within the government. And in fact, it led to a positive change. With that in mind, let's prepare ourselves for some tea and crime. Dagmar Overby was born on the 23rd of April 1887 in a small village in South Denmark. As the daughter of a farming couple named Sorn and Anne-Marie Overby, Dagmar grew up in a small house. The young girl experienced extreme mood swings, with the main one being a cloud of sadness that enveloped her, making her a difficult, moody and demanding child who was prone to lying, stealing and basically getting into mischief. Her parents struggled with the amount of lies that continually came from her mouth, but despite all of the negatives, at school, she was at the top of her class as a highly intelligent individual. However, her bad habits displayed themselves far too much for her parents and when she got caught stealing from one of their neighbours, it was the last straw as far as they were concerned. Growing up in Denmark at that time was very different from today. In rural areas, it was common for a child to go out and serve as a maid, often from the age of seven or eight, so I guess Dagmar was lucky because that crime of theft that she committed was done when she was 12. It caused her parents to send her roughly 80 miles away, to live as a young maid to a farm owner in Funen. She was paid 10 kroner a month during her time, with duties that included cooking, washing, cleaning and milking cows. The work was long and hard, starting at 6 in the morning until half 9 at night, with a day off every third Sunday. When Dagmar eventually left the farm, it was to work as a servant for others in a similar environment. However, her bad habits of lying and stealing continued to be part of who she was. And evidence of this was when she got caught stealing again as a teenager. This time it was from her last employer in Funen. And when it was discovered, she was punished with 10 days in a woman's prison in Svenborg. After her release, she returned to her childhood area, finding work as a waitress in a restaurant. And during that phase, she met a man named Bisgard who caught her attention. They soon fell in love and ended up living together. It wasn't long before she became pregnant with his child, giving birth to a baby boy. However, the child mysteriously died. An autopsy was carried out, indicating that the baby had blue lips, pointing to the sinister possibility that the newborn had been choked to death. The coroner, although he was surprised by what he found, recorded on the death certificate pneumonia as being responsible for taking the boy's life. But people in the community, especially those who knew Dagmar, grew terribly suspicious as they weren't convinced. Dagmar felt so pressurised by the tension on display that she left the town in 1912, abandoning everything, including her boyfriend. That same year, she met someone else named Yen Sorensen, moving in with him. Yet unknown to this new man, Dagmar was already pregnant by another guy. When Yen realised this, he became ashamed, and it had a negative effect on their relationship. Eventually, Dagmar experienced labour pains and Yen 
immediately transported her to a place where she was able to give birth to a little dark-haired girl, who was quickly named Erina Marie Overby. The baby was given up for adoption to prevent embarrassment to Jens, since they weren't married, and the baby wasn't his. The staff at the facility where Erina was born promised to find a good home for her, and Dagmar was hopeful that one day she'd be in a position to take the young one back. The couple remained together, and about a year later she was pregnant yet again. At least this time there was no confusion who the father was. It was Yen. But Yen was adamant there was no way they could raise a baby, therefore he strongly urged Dagmar to get an abortion. She was against that idea, especially as it was illegal at the time. Plus, there were horror stories about how dangerous the procedure was. Untrained people were using primitive methods, and there was a lack of antiseptics. And those willing to perform them, which was done under the cover of darkness, charged extortionate rates. So the idea of an abortion was flatly rejected by Dagmar. Her idea was to have the baby under normal circumstances and then get rid of it. And one point I'd like to stress is that this woman was desperate to marry Jens. In time, she gave birth to a baby boy and you'd imagine she was planning to give him up for adoption like she did previously with Erina. Instead, what she did was abandon this helpless little soul in a haystack on a nearby farm. And then she walks away, leaving him to die. After that cold-hearted performance, she had the audacity to have a chat with Jens about, yeah, you guessed it, marriage. He made it crystal clear that that was never going to happen, effectively putting an end to their relationship. The rejection cut deeply, to the point where she attempted suicide. Anyway, life went on, and somehow, after three years of being separated from her daughter Erina, who'd been in care from birth, that hope she entertained that one day they'd be together again materialised, making it possible for the two of them to start a new life in Copenhagen. In 1915, at the age of 28, Dagmar, who was intelligent, opened a sweet shop in Copenhagen. One of her regular customers was a man with a sweet tooth, who went by the name of Svenden. They were attracted to each other, and before long they were not only dating, but actually moved into an apartment together in Noapu, on Jägersdale Street. Now she had another new man in her life, alongside her daughter Erina, all living under the same roof. However, a problem arose when the sweet shop wasn't providing sufficient income, which led to it closing down. Therefore, Dagmar began actively searching for another form of employment when she discovered one as a childminder specifically taking care of illegitimate children. While working in this new capacity, she was reading the newspaper one day, coming across an article concerning a woman who received the sum of 500 kroners for adopting a child. This was exciting news that could provide an opportunity for sustainable living. Her mind was working overtime, as it prompted her to set up an unofficial adoption agency. Her plan was to offer services to women who gave birth to unwanted babies, requiring them to pay upfront payments, followed by monthly maintenance fees until an adopted family was secured. While searching for the right family, Dagmar, as the intermediary, would allegedly ensure that the child's physiological needs were appropriately cared for. With her agency now set up, the next step was to get people using it. She quickly came across a nad placed by 26-year-old Rasbin Jensen, who'd given birth to a boy out of wedlock and wanted him adopted. The boy named Harry was almost three weeks old when on the 15th of April 1916, Rasbin arrived at Dagmar's home handing the boy over to her, as well as a pile of clothes and nappies, plus a fee of 12 kroners was agreed, which was to be paid monthly until a suitable family was obtained. When Rasbin left, Harry was placed in a pram. Little Erina was told to play safely and wait until her mother returned because she took the baby for a walk down Jägersdale Street toward the local cemetery, where on a sudden impulse she cruelly strangled him to death before dumping his body in a public toilet at the cemetery. She then strolled back home as if nothing had happened. Three days later, the deceased child was discovered and this was the beginning of numerous murders that she went on to commit. Her pretend adoption agency would take infants in 
and promised to look after them until they were placed in appropriate homes. Payments were accepted mainly from young mothers who were poor. Chillingly, the youngsters were never cared for, as they were either strangled, drowned or burnt. Between 1913 to 1920, this woman without a heart murdered as many as 25 children, even buying a camera for macabre purposes. Dagmar began to justify her actions, believing she was doing some good in the world, as the poor mothers were unable to get abortions. Plus, society looked down on them. In the beginning, the women usually brought their children to Dagmar's house for the handover. But when the neighbours displayed their disapproval, she often but not always arranged neutral meeting places. She had this attitude that the unwed girls didn't care about their children, as they were very keen to hand them over with whatever money was agreed on. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, it wasn't true that the mothers didn't care. Well, not entirely, because the actions of one of them would bring an end to the seven-year reign of this monster. On the 30th of August 1920, Caroline Olsen arrived at the doorstep with a three-week-old daughter Sarah who was born out of wedlock and the idea was to leave the baby with Dagmar. Five days earlier, Caroline had placed an advertisement in a newspaper that read, Adoptive parents wanted for a little girl aged three weeks, preferably a Christian home with lots of care and presence. Those words mentioned in the ad for the child to go to a family who could provide lots of care tells me that Caroline wanted the very best for that little girl. She did care. Dagmar answered Caroline's ad with the promise to find a good family who could offer that kind of life to Sarah. Caroline, though, was terribly upset on arrival. Turmoil was a word that described her feelings. She didn't really want to give a child up, but was pressurised by her family to do so. However, Dagmar invited her in for a coffee and chat about the difficult situation. Reassuring the young woman that she acted in a professional capacity as an intermediary between unwanted children and adoptive families. Mentioning that she usually kept the children for a week or two until a family was found. This seemed to calm the mother down until she felt it was safe enough to leave her daughter behind. After taking one final look at Sarah and handing over an agreed payment of 200 kroners, equivalent to a year's wage for domestic workers at that time, Caroline left the apartment crying. Her baby was all she could think about. An awful feeling of emptiness overwhelmed her, and the next day she returned, believing that she'd made a dreadful mistake. Therefore, she wanted her baby back. And this turn of event took Dagmar by complete surprise, who'd already squeezed every ounce of life from Sarah. Although Dagmar explained the day before that she'd keep the infant for a week or two before finding a home, on this occasion she told Caroline that a home for Sarah had already been acquired. But there was an issue as she couldn't remember the address, advising Caroline to pop back later for details. How convenient for this habitual liar and child murderer. The worried mother made three visits overall, and each time was told the same discouraging news that Sarah had been adopted, meaning it was out of Dagmar's control. Caroline became deeply distressed while growing tremendously suspicious. Her gut told her something wasn't right. Call it women's intuition if you like. So she reported this incident to the police. As it involved a baby, they were diligent in their inquiries. They wasted no time paying Dagmar a visit searching her property. And what they found was shocking. When police officers were sent to the apartment on the very same day Caroline reported her concerns, they immediately found Sarah's clothing. Another discovery they came across were 20 photographs of naked kids allegedly murdered, taken by the camera that Dagmar had previously bought. But even more disturbingly, Dagmar's tiled stove was filled with warm ashes, and underneath them lay the remains of bones and small skull fragments belonging to children. Unsurprisingly, she was arrested, and the case of Denmark's most notorious female serial killer was underway. 
Over the next few months, enough evidence was collected and compiled, leading to the 1st of March 1921, where the court held its breath, when the now 33-year-old dark-haired woman with somewhat masculine features stood trial. She became known as the Angel Witch due to sending so many children's souls to heaven. Many of the murder victims' mothers, alongside a huge media presence, sat in the audience observing everything. Dagmar was confronted with the bones found in the stove and, in a cold, calculating manner, and without hesitation, confessed to killing 16 children. However, only nine bodies could be accounted for. Therefore, she was only charged with nine counts of murder. The police, though, were still suspicious with the belief that there could be as many as 25 infants who she murdered, with one of them being a child she was the mother of. In that very same month of March 1921, Dagmar was found guilty and sentenced to death, making her the first woman to receive that sentence since 1861. Women in the court wept with relief, but Dagmar failed to react. However, six weeks later, the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment on the condition that she had never be released. She never was released, but instead died while serving her time in 1929 at the age of 42. And I'm convinced people were probably very happy to hear that news. Interestingly, something positive came from this very haunting account. There was a major shift to reform childcare legislation as the case created debate. And in 1923, it led to the creation of the Act on the Supervision of Foster Children. This allowed Denmark's law to be changed so that unwanted children now became the responsibility of the government. This meant that young parents no longer had to face the danger of potentially handing their children to the would-be Dagmars, or monsters of this world. Nonetheless, it makes you wonder why it took something this awful to have an effect on the law. But we can't really complain, because the conditions for unwanted children in Denmark were significantly improved as a result or at least I hope they were. Let me know what you think about this case in the comments section. There's a couple of other videos on the screen that you might find of interest. Well, I'm Royston. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.